what is the state of American health compared with 50 years ago? And what differences are you seeing? Huge difference. And, you know, first of all, meat consumption have doubled the last hundred years, which means that all the diseases that we see today have skyrocketed of cancer and heart disease and diabetes and obesity, of course. And I think people are starting to realize that healthcare could be, 80% of healthcare could be eliminated if we stayed on a plant-based diet. But most people don't know how to do that. They don't know how I'm gonna get enough calcium protein. So, you know, we've been kind of uh, brainwashed that from the corporations of meat industry that that's where you get your protein. You don't have to wonder. The dairy industry said that's where you get the calcium. Don't wonder. And so, so we thought we're doing a good thing. And then we pay for it with all these diseases, with these environmental toxins that we're all paying in our water, in our air. And our kids are brought up with this and they're getting sick. So we're paying a big price for something that shouldn't have been. And the poor innocent animals are paying the biggest price with their lives. And, you know, working in this field like I have, I've been vegan for 50 years, I'm 65, for 50 years I've been vegan. What made me vegan was not really ethical it was, I wanted to feel better. I wanted to get out of things like uh, headaches and, and um, um, you know, just not having enough energy. And the energy came and, the, and the, um, the headaches went away. And I also had seizures, they went away. So it, it was a wonderful journey. And then came the ethical part. It's like, what is being done to these animals? Well, so I know we're going to talk about that. And I love to talk about that because being a mother myself, I always put myself in everybody else's shoes. How would I feel? You know, how would I feel if my baby is taken away? If I can't nurse my own baby, I nurse my kids two and three years. I mean, it's like a normal thing for a mother to want to do. So the healthcare is not just physical with the foods we eat the exercise we do, it's also emotional and we're paying a big price because we're living in a totally stressful time, not just because of time right now with the flu and all of that, but it's we kind of moved ourselves since the industrial revolution. We moved ourselves into a time where we just work. The family, the, the group, uh, the social and being kind to our neighbors, kind to our family, kind to ourself. It kind of was put on the back burner. And then we kind of wait to, we end up in ER and bang, 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 bang. And we have all these serious problems and serious treatments that here at the Institute, Hippocrates Health Institute, we've been teaching lifestyle for 65 years. And, you know, to see how people change when they get on to a plant-based diet, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It blows people's mind. You know, we have people here right now that were told that there's nothing we can do, you know, live with it and, and you're not going to live long. And now they're seeing future. Now they're seeing hope. They're feeling no pain anymore. Their body is changing. The numbers on the blood test is just flying down. If they were high or if they were low, they're coming up. The body is so willing. It's so intelligent and it's so willing. It's just, we need to trust it. So healthcare, yes, healthcare is really terrible right now. I'm not talking the care that you get once you're in the hospital, but the healthcare, we have sick care. Yes, we have sick care. We don't have healthcare. We don't. During the 20 year period you spent looking at blood under the microscope, mm -hmm. what clear conclusions can you make about the impact of food on our health? Oh, huge. So when you look at blood, you magnify it like 10,000 times on the microscope, you get to see what's going on. You get to see how, 
how food impact every cell in your body. Every cell in your body also have cellular memory and it carries oxygen and nourishment. That is your red blood cell. You have your white blood cells that are different kinds you, and they are doing, it's like different agents that are controlling. So lymphocytes, of course, are the ones that control all of it. And they make antibodies and they kill whatever shouldn't be there. And they know exactly what is not right. What if it doesn't have frequency and the right frequency, it will kill it. So it has a one track mind. I tell, I just talked to a woman now who just took her out, um, her uh, breast implants out. And we talked about that um, 2015 when she was here last. And two years ago, she, she took them out and her life has changed because the immune system doesn't know that we want these things. They will attack them. They don't have frequency. It will be attacked. So it's an intelligence that's impeccable. And, you know, we have to realize that we are the boss. We are the boss. It can't live without us. It's doing everything for us, everything it can. But we have to realize we're not a garbage can. We have to eat food that it's supposed to have. If we look at a carnivore, a carnivore has this really sharp uh, molars and sharp uh, teeth. And look at their paws with the sharp um, paws and uh, claws, they're meant to eat an, a wild animal. And in, in the wilderness, of course, they will. The only animals that have problems like us is our pets, our cats and dogs that eat like we do, or that eat rotten food, rotten meat and rotten fish or whatever we give them that they never would in the wilderness. They get our cancer, our arthritis, our diabetes, our obesity, they get everything we get. So, and the, the way that they're a, a, a carnivore, which we are not at all. So their jaw only opens up and down. Our jaw opens up and down side to side. And our digestive tract is very long. It's like six times long. A, a digestive tract for a carnivore is only very short, double their size. So it goes very fast because their stomach acid is very rich. Ours is very weak, very weak. And people get acid reflux, people get ulcers, people get colon cancer, digestive problems, IBS, Crohn's, colitis, you name it. And it all has to do with so much the lifestyle that we've chosen to be in, especially the last century. And it's, uh, you know, once you realize you were not meant to be a carnivore, you, I think you will look at a plant-based diet as the only sustainable diet. Is the ultimate, ultimate diet raw green vegetables, sprouts, seeds, sea vegetables? Would you add or take anything away from diet? And how would you get full? Would you be missing any nutrients on the diet? Yeah. So no, you're not missing, but it depends on how you do it. A lot of people become vegan and they think a salad that, um, at McDonald's is enough or something like that. No, so essential fatty acids are very important. We don't make them, we have to eat them every day. How do we get them? We get them from sprouts. We get them from blue-green algae, chlorella. We get them from uh, avocado, of course, from nuts. We get them from olives. We get them from olive oil, hemp oil, chia oil, chia seeds, hemp seeds. You will not lack anything when you're on a good diet. Our sprout juice is full of protein, calcium, essential fatty acids, phytochemicals. It's full of nutrients. It's the highest nutritious diet that you can choose is the live food diet. And that's what we've been taking people through. And so, you know, we only suspect, we only expect success because we've seen it for so many years. Brian and I have been directing this for 40 years now. It's the 40, 41st year now starting. And, you know, I've been doing this for 48 years. I ran a clinic in Sweden before, and I saw the results changing to a plant-based diet. Not even as good as this. This is, the, this is the best. You know what happens, guest tells me, They've been looking into all the diets that are out there, and we have amazing Dr. Campbell, Esselstyn, 
And then they realize we are there. And they're like, this is a whole other ball game. Now you're talking raw living foods with all the nutrients there. And sprouts, of course, is the easiest food to digest. We've just been working with a young man with ileostomy and um, who they messed up totally with medication and all. He's been fed through a tube the last two years. Seeing him now, he's eating a big salad. He's eating for the first time in two years. And he is assimilating. He's, you know, it's, um, he's, he's going to live a great life. So the body is willing to change. And, um, you know, seeing it year after year, day after day, that we are meant to be on a plant-based diet. Our, our structure is for plant-based diet. So what we forced, what we forced ourselves, because we could not eat raw meat. Raw meat is so full of bacteria and parasites and everything. So when the fire came around, they started to cook meat. But, and then they thought that the bacteria and parasites were gone. No, no, no. They live in the muscle tissue. So we're getting it. How many times do they recall E. coli, salmonella, all of that? We get big time infections from animals. Eggs that now is selling like hotcakes, somehow eggs is the next thing, next best thing out there. And uh, they're full of E. coli and salmonella. So people are just eating stuff that they have no idea what that's going to do. When Ontario University in Toronto did a study about what's in a breast cancer tissue, E. coli and salmonella. It's right there. Where do you get that from? People saying, well, you get it from spinach. No, you get it. It's from fecal matter from another animal. <laughs> so that's a deal. Some people don't feel full eating raw vegetables and sprouts. What foods can they eat to get? So we have fun. We have dehydrator. Dehydrator is this um, machine that has a um, heater and a fan to control the temperature. So we can keep food alive and keep it under 115 Fahrenheit or 44, 45 Celsius. So we make crackers, I make a veggie burger, I make bread, I make, I mean, our staff here, our team is amazing in our kitchen to make dehydrated stuff. We make pizzas. I mean, it's like Friday pizza. <laughs> so that fills you up. That's just an add on to your salad, but it fills you up and it feels like you're getting something that's cooked that's, that you're more familiar with. And we make, uh, we make all kinds of dishes like Indian um, meals. We make um, Mexican meals and they're, they're raw. We can wrap things into a collard green and we, we take, for example, walnuts. We soak them overnight, then I dehydrate them. Then I can put them in a food processor with spices like Mexican or whatever I want. And then I put it into a wrap and I eat it like a wrap. People love it here. It's one of their favorites. So nuts, we don't eat a lot. If you look at nuts and seeds, they grow different. Seeds, you will soak overnight and sprout for 24 hours and they will sprout easy. Nuts, we sprout 12 to 24 hours. And the only nuts we don't use are cashew and peanuts as they have this fungus called aflatoxin, which is a carcinogen. So we stay out of that. And they, you will get gray hair before they sprout. So you soak them and then we dehydrate to keep them for a longer time. You can eat them right away after they're soaked, of course. So that fills you up, avocado, make guacamole and make wraps with that and tons of vegetable and grains that you can soak and sprout especially millet, quinoa, the gluten-free, amaranth, teff. These are great. Soak and sprout, make a salad with, you know, scallions and, and um, peppers and, and whatever you like and fix it up and, and um, have that. So these things will fill you up. Or you make something in the dehydrate, like a cracker out of that. Yes. 
some people promote water fasting. You advocate green juice fasting. Mm -hmm. Which one is healthier? How often should we do it? How often do you do it? So we do intermittent fasting when we every day, but we fast one day and we stop eating. Um, here we do it on Wednesdays. And um, all the guests that are able to fast will fast on Wednesday. Some people have gone through a lot of treatments. They're not ready to fast, so they will eat. But usually by second and third week, a lot of people want to try fasting. And they're surprised because it's juice. So it's, uh, we have green juice. We have wheatgrass. We, and of course, we're in Florida. We have a lot of coconut trees. So we pick the coconuts down. Everybody get a coconut for lunch when we fast. And then we have juice again. And then of course they have teas and lemon water as the day goes by. It's a day of more rest, that it's more restful day. We're walking and if you're working out, you're not working out hard. So it should be the day that it's easier for you. And the deal is um, that the intermittent fasting we do kind of every day because we don't eat breakfast. Uh, Brian and I, are, uh, some of our guests eat breakfast, of course, but we fast after dinner and we don't eat until lunch. So that's intermittent fasting and which, you know, has been proven being amazing. Dr. Longo has, and a lot of people have worked on that and find how beneficial and how it boosts your immune system. The fasting, it stops Tuesday night for us and it's all Wednesday and, it, and we don't eat until lunch. On, when, on Thursday. So it's more than one day, but we call it one day fast. Why it's different water fast. We do have opportunity to do water fast here too. And of course, other places are doing water fast. Uh, we ha just had a guest who did a two week water fast. It's, um, it's a different deal uh, on juice fast. You know, you're outside, you're doing treatments, you're doing uh, exercise in moderation and you're socializing different and water fast, you're very peaceful. You're staying in your room and you're taking care of, of course, people see you many times during the day, but you're not really doing anything but water fast. So it's a different deal. So I ran a fasting clinic in Sweden and that was also juice fasting. And we added lots of garlic to that. So, um, you know, which is anti-parasitic and natural antibiotic, anti-cancer. So we had great results with that too. So I, I know in Europe, there was a lot of fasting clinics when I ran it. Uh, more or less, they're, they're not existing anymore. And so people probably do a lot on their own at home. But I think... Um, because of the industrialization of everything, even the poor animals got into totally, they're, they're just, they're just uh, industrial uh, um, plants. I mean, they're just uh, used as not an animal anymore. So they're, um, you know, we, we kind of let go of all moral. You know, remember Gandhi said, the moral progress of a nation can be judged by how its animals are treated. And this is exactly, I think we can put that together. How we're treating our animals is how we're treating humans. We are kind of got totally off track and we need to be human. We need to be human to the animals. We, it's not, they're not ours to treat like we do. It's not ours to, to to rape and, and, and treat so poorly. And, um, you know, I'm saying rape because for example, if you're a mother cow, you're being inseminated um, once a year, as well, as soon as you have the baby, because now as soon as the baby, baby calf is taken away from you and you are now inseminated because you, they want to get your milk. And of course, if you're pregnant, now the more milk you're gonna have. So they just became milk, milk producing cows. 
And like any animal, a cow, just like I would be if my baby was taken away, as soon as I gave birth, I'm, she's looking for him, her. She's looking for him or her. She's crying out to find her. She, and she'll never stop. She will never stop. And so this romantic view that we have on mother calf and the calf is right beside mom and she's learning from mom and she, dairy cows have nothing of that in their whole life, nothing. And they're usually slaughtered within three years when they could live probably 20 more years. It's, uh, it's, it's what we have created with our needs and we can change that. We are the only one that can change that. And you, you can change it with your wallet because if you don't support it anymore, you go plant-based, you are doing your share. Of all the people you've advised over the last 10 years who follow your advice, what were the results? What percent got to their optimal blood sugar, blood pressure, and weight? What percent, what percent reversed major health issues? And what percent didn't get the expected results? Well, that's okay. So that's a tough question because uh, we only expect success while you're at the Institute. And we have most people here three weeks, some people six weeks. Our program is three weeks. So because in 21, in 21 days, you have a big change, a big boost of your immune system. Of course, I wish people could stay for years <laughs> to show them what's possible. So it depends on how much they do when they go back home. More than 80% of our guests comes back. So I get to see them and some fell off and some stayed as good as they could, but they're coming back just to get re, re um, into it and you know get, get the inspiration and get the latest information too. So we do test them with uh, CyberScan. These are frequency tests. These are biofeedback tests and biowell. So we get an idea where they're at. We have the normal blood test of CBC and chemistry that our medical team looks through. And so we, we, we have an idea. Looking at blood tests before and after, three weeks here, for example, diabetes type two. Diabetes type two, we call it no brainer. You will see high triglycerides, high cholesterol. It will just fly down on a plant-based diet because not mainly that diabetes will never go away as long as you are on a animal-based diet because the insulin that you have to have to eat animal fat, the chickens, the eggs, the dairy, the poultry, and the, and the meat is requiring so much more insulin than, than uh, any other sugar in a way. We don't eat sugar. We have no sugar in this diet. There is, if needed, or I would say if it's actually right time, 15% of the diet can be fresh organic fruit. So, but most people that I see every day, I say, let's stay out of fruit for some time now because they've had enough of sugar. Alcohol is a big time now. I read uh, Newsweek had an article about that, that people that normally had one glass of wine, now it's one bottle. If they had two glasses of wine, now it's two bottles. And it's not, it's hard liquor, it's all kinds. Of, we have a lot more alcoholics right now. But that I think has steadily been like something totally acceptable. So what I see, for example, with uh, wine, all the alcohols have sugar. And, and the sodas, of course, and uh, diet soda, which is the worst, diet soda has this aspartame. So people think that I'm taking that to lose weight. You gain weight with that and you gain cancer and you gain all kinds of things. But obesity, diabetes comes right with those things that we are exporting all over the world and exporting all our diseases at the same time. You would think that countries leaders would look and say, well, you know, if I'm doing what America has been doing, then I'm going to get the same diseases. It's going to cost our healthcare system huge money. Do we really want to go that way? So 
but obviously that's not happening because everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. Everybody wants to eat lots of meat. They want lots of milk products, all the stuff that we can tell you until we're blue in the face, it will make you sick and it will make the environment sick. It will make your kids sick. So, you know, I, I don't know how much we can say because it's, it's so clear that the body can heal itself. It knows how to heal itself. It's got to go back to origins. It's got to go back to what we were meant to eat. From a health standpoint, should we try to add oils such as flax, hemp, and walnut oil to our diets or should we try to avoid it? So essential fatty acids, we don't make. We, it's very important that we get them every day. Do we need it from oil? Can I get it from seeds and grains and um, beans sprouted, right? Yes, I can. Avocados, olives. So we add a little bit of olive oil, hemp seed oil, chia oil. It's okay in moderation. Of course, I don't want my salad to swim in it. <laughs> but, you know, maybe a teaspoon or a tablespoon uh, goes a long way. I get it from blue-green algae. Actually, blue-green algae, which is so fantastic, has exactly the same um, fat as the brain has. So the brain is 60% fat. Blue-green algae has exactly the same. So blue-green algae is a part of our daily life. And, you know, avocado has amazing glutathione on top of it. And of course, the essential fats and walnuts is the highest in omega-3. Omega-3 from fish oil, I hope that you know that it's made by squeezing the oil out of the fish <laughs> with its mercury, with its feces, with anything that might come. And it would taste so bad unless they put uh, taste uh, fillers in there, you would never take that. And it's nothing that you need. You don't need to harm fish, to get their oil out of them, to stay healthy. Nothing we need from a fish in any way. We don't need fish in any way. And what we're doing today, we have the fish farms and they're either in this big uh, lake, uh, man-made lakes, or they're in the ocean in these small cages for fish. Fish, I mean, we're scuba divers. We know fish, of course, fish goes and they can, they can swim all over the place. And they, they have an inherent, they have, uh, you know, we all have something called magnetites. And of course, fish has amazing, so does birds, everybody. We have magnetites in our brain, all over through our body, especially in our brain. How birds fly to the south in the, in the fall and come back in the spring is because of magnetites. So now you're putting them in a cage and they're just gonna be in this cage, thousands and thousands in a cage where they, they, they have nowhere to go. It's awful, it's awful. And some of them sneak out, they get out. And then the poor fish that's outside, now they're genetic. Um, DNA and the genetic uh, being is changing now too. So we're changing the whole ocean. And plus these fish, especially big, uh, you know, salmon, tuna, cod, and all of them, they're fed the small, tiny fish in from the ocean, which now changes the whole ecosystem. So we're, we're changing ecosystem everywhere we go. The human beings, we need to start saying, what is our place here? And, you know, religious people would say, well, you're created in the, in the, um, in the view of God. And, and I would say then, what, what, what responsibility we would have if you really think so? This, would be this should be taught in every church, every temple, every synagogue, everywhere this should be taught and the responsibility that we have for the environment, for the forest, for the logging that we do so that the cows can go there and we eat their meat. It's like, it's horrendous, you know? And people say, well, our economy would fall down. Our economy would collapse if we all went plant-based. Let it collapse, let people get healthy, let people realize that we need every person on this earth because every person has a reason to be here. 
How do you permanently get rid of candida 100% once and for all? Okay, so candida, well, it takes commitment. Candida is now this systemic yeast infection and it's a parasitic infection. So a lot of people have to realize I need to work on parasite cleanse. We use something here called Freedom Cleanse. It's amazing. And it's something you might do three months, six months. At the same time, of course, I stay out of all animal products. I stay out of all fruits and all sugar, all alcohol. Of course, I don't want to do a cleanse and then feed because they feed on sugar. They feed on high fat and high protein. They, I would say McDonald's, Burger King, you name it. They're all feeding candida. They're all feeding candida. So we're, um, it takes time to get rid of candida. It could take uh, up to two years. So it depends on how committed you are. And there is candida cleanse, there's parasite cleanse, there is feeding the body B12, vitamin D, enzymes, probiotic, you know, just really feeding the body good stuff with the juices and the wheatgrass and all the things we've been doing for all these years, you know, it works. Candida is really immobilizing. It's, uh, you have no energy, your memory goes down the drain and, um, you know, you're just, you're feeling uh, pretty lost. How do you protect your thyroid? What supplements should we take? Should we take iodine or can that cause thyroid problems? Okay, so nowadays thyroid is an epitome. It's a big problem. So uh, an animal food is a big part of that too. But so is pollution. So is the lack of iodine. The most thyroid problems is an iodine deficiency. It's very clear. So where did we normally get iodine? Well, it was in salt, but then in the 70s, we took it away and we just left sodium chloride. So people were lacking it. Then they added iodized sodium and in, you know, iodized, um, iodine into the salt, but that evaporates as soon as you open the thing. So we use seaweed, we use dolls, you can use kelp, nori, Seaweed is loaded with good iodine. Iodine is something because my whole family, my mom had serious thyroid problem, all her sisters and brothers and my cousin. So I've been taking iodine. We use a 100% bioavailable iodine here. I use a few drops of that. I use selenium and zinc. Selenium and zinc, very important for the thyroid too. Plus all three are amazing immunoboosters, especially now since the flu happened and flu happens every year. So, you know, we we really have a great um, immunobooster from this. And I drink that every day in a little bit of water or juice. And that's, uh, that's been a lifesaver. That's, that keeps my thyroid in good shape. Some people have hyperthyroid like Graves disease and they're often told that now we need to nuke it, we need to kill it and you'll be on medication for the rest of their life. We have, the, and of course, most people that come here have already had all the treatments. We had a young lady, um, 30 years old, that had, were diagnosed with Graves. She's totally fine. She has, she's doing the diet. She's doing exercise, a lot of emotional work. And because Graves disease often have to do with an emotional trauma, like divorce or, you know, death or some big emotional trauma. So it takes a lot of emotional work. Every guest that comes to Hippocrates sees our psychotherapist. Is reversing early stage cancer with lifestyle easy or hard or impossible? <laughs> what about late stage cancer? So uh, early stage cancer, of course, everything is easier, early stage, early stage Parkinson, MS, you name it. Everything is easier, early stage. So what happens, the body gets used to a certain stage. So if it's early, it's better. Late stage, a lot of people come here late stage too. Now, is it hard to change lifestyle? Yeah. It, it is because your family might not want you to, your friends thinks you're nuts. 
then you have to say, okay, what's more important? You know, you came to this life alone. You kind of came alone, even though you came through your mother and you, got, you will leave alone. So what's this space that I get here? Maybe I get 70, 80, 90, maybe I get 100, maybe more. But it's a very short time when you think about it. So at the end of the day, you're the boss. You're the boss. And I think when people choose to commit to a lifestyle that have proven so many times to help other people heal themselves, then you look at them and you say, okay, then I, I want to try something natural first. And I think most cultures all over the world says, you try lifestyle first. You always go to lifestyle. If I have diabetes, if I have obesity, if I have thyroid problem, what, what if I tried lifestyle before I did some serious medication that they want me for the rest of my life? So now let's say that I now was just diagnosed. I was diagnosed with um, prostate cancer or breast cancer which happens here a lot, which people do come here because they wanna try lifestyle first. So a lot of them have had the testing and the biopsy and then they said, okay, hold your horses. Now I have to take a break. I don't know what I wanna do next. So yes, now, of course, with our lifestyle, which is 100% raw, there is no fruit, there's no sugar, it is so nourishing that it will nourish every cell in your body. And then we work emotionally with you. So a lot of people find that they have been able to heal themselves. We can't heal anybody. How can we heal? It's, this is you doing it. You're doing it for yourself. You're continuing at home. But a lot of people have, they call us later, maybe six months later, a year later, and they said, I had a clean bill of health. And it's, it's so amazing to hear that. Late stage, so many people have got clean bill of health too that have come through our program and committed. I tell stories all the time for our guests and that, you know, it's when you say that it's done. It's when you say that it's done. It's when you believe that it's done. And a lot of times you get diagnosis, you get to hear from your physician, oncologist or so, that, um, you know, we hit a wall. Cancer is metastasis, this is what we have and there's nothing more we can do. That's, that's when some people come too. And they're broken, they're low weight, low white blood count, low hemoglobin. I mean, there's, they're, they're very broken, but they get it. And, and the ones who get it, they do it. And often we hear from them too, that, you know, got a clean bill of health. Same with uh, so many other problems that people take for granted you have it. Look at dementia, look at Alzheimer. If we could get that in the beginning stage, amazing results, but you know, late stage dementia is of course, now you, you know, this, this um, tau protein that's just not covering all your neurons, it's, it's not going to go away. Naturally, the body cleans that up. The body cleans it up every day, but now it's gone so far that um, the body wasn't able, obviously, to clean. It's, it's really sad. I worked one year in a nursing home, and I worked with people that, with Alzheimer. They knew me because I saw them every day. They didn't know their family. They didn't know. They thought it was nice people came to visit. They had no idea it was their daughter. Women, 70% of people that get Alzheimer is women. So I always talk to women. Boy, we have to make sure that we are totally aware of what causes this. And this is something that I will talk about at Real Truth About Health too in April. Do you recommend biopsies? When should you do it and when should you avoid it? Well, there is no, uh, there is no doctor that will tell you what kind of cancer you have unless you have biopsy. Biopsy, um, I learned something from a physician, a, a, a surgeon actually. And he told me this, he said, okay, 
I do a biopsy, but I will already have told you, if this biopsy is positive, then I will want to do a surgery within 24 hours, or otherwise I'm not gonna do a biopsy. So that was, that was the mind openers because most people have biopsy and maybe two weeks later, oops, it was positive, I need to see you. We need to have a plan of how we're gonna deal with this. He said, forget it. I do biopsy, I'm gonna to wanna to take it out. Why would I do biopsy if I'm not taking it out right away? So then the question is, do you want to take the breast out if, there, if it's positive? Or do you now say, okay, well now I wanna think about it because it's, if it's positive, now I, I put a needle into it many times, not just, you know, many times because they don't wanna miss. So maybe 10 times into that breast tissue and maybe some are okay, negative, and some are positive. That's all it takes. So now I spread it. And you know, if you look at cancer, it looks like a lump and then it has tentacles, long tentacles. And these tentacles are the ways to go into vital organs, liver, kidney, bones, brain, you know, whatever they wanna go, wherever they find a good place to make new tumors. And you know what they found? Uh, is uh, Jerusalem um, University found this fusobacterium in our gums that actually is a huge part of how cancer spreads. So not only do we have that already uh, from sugars and meat and all of that, then we also have this biopsy. So people have to think and they have to have a good physician to talk and, and explain Look, you know, what about lifestyle? Because lifestyle is not even in the plan. It's not in the plan at all. Nutrition is not in the plan. Your emotions are not in the plan. And like an old surgeon told me, he healed arthritis uh, with us, but he said, you come to me, what do you think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cut things out. <laughs> if you have a bad gallbladder, I'm gonna cut it out. That's my job, you know? So I go to an oncologist, what do you think I'm gonna do? What do you think I have? The tools I have is radiation, chemo, you know, I have serious tools. So lifestyle is what we are about. Lifestyle is very much what the whole, the real truth of health is about. That's what we are about. We're teaching people, if we need hospital, you go to hospital, you don't come to us. You come to us if you wanna change lifestyle and you wanna prolong your life, you wanna have vitality, you wanna rejuvenate your life, you wanna, you wanna have a life that is full of time to do the things that you wanna do, that you, I'm not immobilized, I'm not fatigued, I'm not sad, I'm, you know, I'm picking myself up from that kind of lifestyle that a lot of people live with today. There's a lot of fear, a lot of sadness, a lot of loneliness. And, you know, it's sad that we have that because why people live in communities is because we all need each other. But we kind of created these high rise buildings. You don't know your neighbors. You go home at night, you're alone. TV is your only friend. It's going to cut years of your life. Brigham and Young did a study about that. It said it could cut 15 years of your life. And we don't eat well when we're, when we're sad and lonely. We're not, we're not gonna eat the great salads and do sprouting. So we gotta take ourselves out of that. That's what we do too. That's what we do. What alternatives are there to antibiotics? How do you know when to use them and when to use a, a real antibiotic? Well, so antibiotic works on uh, bacteria not on virus, but it's used on all kinds of viral infections. So it's a great tool when we need it, of course, but it's overused because animal feed is full of it. So all the chickens and the cows and the pigs and the turkeys, all, you know, all, it's all full of antibiotics. So we are very much resistant to it. 
Natural antibiotics are, of course, my favorite garlic. <laughs> and then you go on. Natural antibiotics are the foods, the live food. It gives you nourishment, oxygen, because the more oxygen you have in your body, the less disease you're going to have. Enzymes is in the live food. We take extra enzymes to help the body. We take vitamin D. Of course, that's not actually a vitamin. It's a hormone, but it's a natural antibiotic. And, you know, vitamin C, of course, is a natural antibiotic. So here we have IVs. People take a low or high dose of vitamin C with glutathione and and, um, you know, see enormous energy and recovery from all of this. So there's a time for antibiotic, but most of the time we overuse it. Do you recommend colonoscopies for people who eat and live a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet and lifestyle? Well, I know um, that it's common um, use and... You know, so the deal is, it depends on how I've been living. If you're, if you're worried about colon cancer, keep eating meat, keep eating um, pig, uh, the, uh, ham, keep eating eggs, dairy, all the poultry, meat, keep eating that. Because if you eat that, that's highway to colon cancer. That's been researched over and over and over. So if I don't eat that and I eat a lot of sugar, keep eating that and you're in trouble. So, you know, a diet needs to be balanced with lots of nutrition, lots of fluids. We can't dehydrate. We want to have plenty of fluids and we want plenty of exercise. If I exercise, if I walk and I lift weights, I am helping my colon. So it depends on my lifestyle. Do I really need it? Um, some people feel like they need it because they have it in their family. Go ahead, you know? I mean, I wouldn't say to not do it. Um, some people find polyps. Polyps can turn to cancer. And uh, maybe that, maybe one time you do it and you find polyps and you say, you know, I better really take care because this is beginning of problems. Most people don't think polyps is beginning of problem. They're like, oh, they took it out. It was nothing. And then one day they have colon cancer, <clears throat> rectal cancer, anal cancer, you name it. And that's coming down in age now, big time. All cancers are coming down in age. All problems are coming down in age. What we would see people maybe be 60, 70, 80 years old having problems from diabetes down to cancer now have plummeted down very, very, very young and unbelievably sad to see. So a lot of young people come here that just started their life and now they're facing so much so much suffering, so much treatments, and it feels like it's never ending. Can dementia be prevented and how? Yeah, so dementia can be prevented with lifestyle and it has a lot to do with pollution. They actually did a study in um, Canada about if you live 50 meter away from a high traffic road, like freeway, or 200 meter, 12 times greater chance for dementia and Alzheimer if I, leave, if I live 50 meter away. A lot of people do. A lot of people live really close to a high, to high traffic road with all the pollution. Look at, I just talked to somebody from New York. It's, she can't open a window, it's horrendous. It's so much pollution. The, the greenhouse gases that we get from animal farms is 30 times more dangerous than the carbon dioxide that we get from cars. Imagine that. So we're creating an enormous pollution by having factory farms, which is industrial farm. Now, a cow is not worth anything. A pig is not worth anything. A pig could live easy 10 years or more. They live six months, six months, and they're killed. 
It's, uh, but we're doing this to ourselves. We're doing this to ourselves with our diseases. We're cutting our lifespan. The latest um, check on uh, how long we live now, they said, then the uh, 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 World Health Organization or FDA came out with this we cut a year, we cut one more year. So if we normally should live to 76, we're down to 75. Yeah, and, and the latest is that our kids and grandkids will live five years later, uh, will live five years less than we will do. That's our lifestyle. It's nuts. It could so easily be changed. We have a lot of land. We could plant a ton of food for everyone, for everyone, where one steer walks around we could have thousands of people being fed. We can make a choice. It's easy choice when you think about it. It's the only sustainable choice. Do you recommend mammographies? Oh yeah, so mammography is a pretty cruel thing for women because the breast is like pushed together and radiated, nuked. And radiation causes cancer. What are we uh, worried about with uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima? We're worried about cancer, right? This radiation is in one atmosphere and we're all getting it sooner or later. This is heavy duty um, radiation. So there are other tools that are better. And yeah, thermography is not the end of tools, but it's just a camera. You're sitting in a cold room, there's no radiation. And we, you know, we get a picture in colors of where there are maybe inflammations, things going on. And usually if, if inflammation shows up, then you're um, um, told that you should do probably a MRI. MRI is great. It's magnetic resonance imaging, but then you're given a nuclear. Um, um, and so you have to do without that. <laughs> And can it be done without it? Yes, it can be done. Ultrasound is another tool. And hopefully there will be better tools in the future too for people to see what's going on. Some women, for example, with breast cancer can feel it. A lot of tumors we don't feel, you know, it's even hard to see because it takes so many years for it to show up on an MRI or on PET scan or CAT scan or mammograms. So we're kind of doing this test every year and nobody told you, you better change lifestyle because what are you waiting for? I tell people, if you're hearing that you are some suspicion that there could be um, bad things going on, you're not gonna sit and wait for them to tell you a year from now, oops, this went bad. No, I would act right away of course you're going to act right away are there any diet or lifestyle decisions that can help with menopause oh fantastic so i went through it about 16 years ago and uh, amazing so getting into menopause you know when i first um, i was lecturing about it in montreal years ago long before my own menopause. And they said, please talk about menopause. And I'm like, well, I'm not an expert. So I had to read up. Of course, I read uh, Northrop and, and Gail Shi and everybody. And in those days, everybody said, oh, this is terrible time. And you have to take hormones and you're not gonna have any, any energy anymore. You're gonna be depressed and, and uh, libido is down the drain and all your life is over. So then, uh, then you realize once you go through it, it's a transition. Yes, you dropped like this when it comes to hormones, your adrenal still makes hormones all you need. If I sleep good enough, if I eat well, I drink well, and I exercise and I have happiness, I do a job that I love, I'm with my family, I have a good partner, I have relationships, then it's a no big deal. It's, it's what you, you, the transition can take certain times, three months, years for some women. 
It depends on how much you do. And I wish we all were taught about our emotions. And, you know, the traumas in our life, the bad food, the exercise we didn't do, you know, now it's like, now it hits us. And now is the time, even our founder Ann Wigmore, who, because she had stage four colon cancer, got herself healed naturally, totally naturally. But it hit her in her 50s. And I ran a clinic in Sweden for an amazing lady that she had rheumatoid arthritis. It hit her in the 50s. So then we blame menopause, don't we? We blame, all women blame menopause. Oh, that's when I got cardiovascular disease, diabetes, you name it. It just kind of falls on us. And it's not true. It took 50 years plus to get to where we are at with our problems. And, and of course, hormones. How do I make hormones? I make hormones from my food, the sleep, the exercise, the happiness I have. That's how I make hormones. If I absolutely need something, you take bioidentical hormones, of course. That's, um, you know, that's a no brainer. You don't want to take hormones that has been researched. The big nurses study did show that it caused cancer. So you want to live a lifestyle where the estrogen that you're worried about, the imbalance of hormones you're worried about is from very much the food that you've been eating that's full of hormones. Antibiotics are steroids. These are all hormones, the mess is with you. Eat, diet, organic, GMO free foods. What are the most important things to rebuild our gut microbiome? And what mm. supplements should we take for this? Oh, microbiome. So you have 100 trillion bacteria called microbes in a name called microbiome. And this is where 70% of your immune system is made. 90% of your serotonin, which is the happy juice. What they found is you know, when you're eating fiber rich, cellulose rich foods, nourishing food, live food, of course, that works amazing. When everything I eat is dead, it doesn't suddenly turn alive in my body. My body has a hard time to digest foods that are dead to begin with. So even cooked plant based food. So I say 80% of your microbiome needs to be really healthy. 20% could be bad. It could be parasites, could be um, uh, mold. It could be bacteria, virus. But because I have 80%, I have such a good balance. So we have all kinds of bugs in our, in our uh, gut. So your gut and your brain, this called gut-brain axis, are totally communicating. So Many people have figured out that, you know, you would think that if I'm sad, my gut doesn't function. Maybe it's my gut making me sad. One professor found um, that the serotonin that's made in your gut, 90% is made in your gut from tryptophan, is if my diet, is totally junk food, you know, fast food, you name it. It might not make, the tryptophan might not make serotonin. Isn't this interesting? It might make a poison. This professor called it kinurenin. It's really amazing. So it's pure poison instead. No wonder people can't think straight. They, they, a lot of people are not themselves because of the foods that they've been ingesting and the liquids, the dairy, the sodas, the alcohol, it changes your microbiome. Your microbiome, you get your microbiome from your mom. Within 20 minutes that you're born, you get it, you have it from your mom. And it's not just from mom, it's grandma, great grandma. You know, it's gone down in generations, of course, mom got it from somewhere. So it's a gift to a baby. If I'm not born vaginal, then I don't get that, but then hopefully I'm nursed. So if I don't get that, I, I joke and I say that newborn will suckle on anybody's skin because 
skin has microbes. So then, you know, when you get that newborn and they suckle on your arms, it's, it's instinctive to build up your microbiome. So most of us were not nursed. Uh, Brian and I was not nursed. Brian was born cesarean. I had a normal birth, but they kept me in the hospital and did surgeries. And, you know, it's, it's um, a lot of times when you're, when you're born in a hospital, it's, it's a totally different deal when like my kids are born at home and born in water and water births and that gentle beginning of life. It just starts and you're nursed. And like, we are the only species that drinks milk from another species. It's like nuts. We do. And we do it far beyond our infancy, far beyond. Crazy, crazy. And these poor dairy calves, all they know is to be a dairy calf. They're hooked up, they're inseminated. It's a cruel thing to be inseminated. It's so cruel and so painful. And people think, well, they're dairy cows. They don't know any better. These are social beings. These are beings that all they know is how to raise a child, the calf, be with him, teach him, teach her. And sad, they never get to experience, never. What are the realistic expectations men and women should have about their sex drive once they're over 60? Is there anything that would help increase it? Yes, of course. Lifestyle, exercise big time. And, um, you know, taking a rest once in a while. We need to take vacations. 70% of Americans don't take vacations. And 70%... Now, I say 50% of Americans don't take vacation. 70% hates their job. So this is a bad mix. So, yes. So intimacy, libido, sex. You know, I just talked to somebody who says her partner has to take, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, well, the pills to, to have, um, um, to be able to have sex. And... Uh, and she has a problem because she's dry since menopause. So this is a bad combination. So first of all, it takes um, a good relationship. It takes that we do things together. We exercise together. We, we, we have, if we don't work together, that we have hobbies together, that we share a ton of things. Of course, we can't be too to individuals that don't have anything in common, but we, we use um, a mix of um, um, nourishment, it's called Circulation Max, and that is great to uh, help ED, but it's really very much for cardiovascular problem, circulation problems, and it makes nitric oxide, and that's the deal. <laughs> that's the deal. So, I think people really need to realize that this needs to start long before we're 60, but it's not, not too late. It's not too late, but the, the sooner that we start with lifestyle, the better life we're gonna have when we get older. And I know that baby boomers don't want to be lost. Uh, they, wanna, they wanna have a life until they die. They wanna have good sex life, good, they wanna be able to exercise, go places, travel. They wanna have social life, they wanna, you know. And when people say, I eat well, <laughs> that means that I should be able to eat anything I want. That is the wrong thing to think because then it takes it to, I should be able, I can afford it. I can eat, afford to eat meat three times a day. I can have desserts, I can have alcohol. Then you pay a big price. So if you're, if you're instead saying, I can eat really well, eat a plant-based diet, I can take walks, I can exercise, I can take care so that I'm able to do everything that I want to do. That's the deal, you know? Vibrant life, rejuvenation and taking care, having vacation. I know people look forward to retirement. It's one of the biggest stressors in our life. Imagine that. 
one of the biggest stressors. Here, people look forward to retire. I don't ever want to retire. I, the people I have worked with never retired, and Big Moore never retired. Alma in Sweden, that I ran her clinic, she never retired. She lived to 96, she never stopped working. Were we supposed to stop working? No, that's because of the industrial revolution that we worked so hard, so many hours, 12, 14, 16 hours, we were burned out that we had retirement and we lived a few more years. Not, not the life. We need to change the way we think about shifts working and how much do we need? How many things do we need in our life? You know, how many things do you need in your life? <laughs> you need yourself. You need a family that you can take care of, that stays healthy, that you can teach as much by being an example. Yeah. What can we do to prevent against bone fractures? There was a study that came out recently saying vegans have more bone fractures. What did you think about this? Mm -hmm. Vegans does not have more bone fractures. The, the, if you look at the osteoporosis in the world, it's in the Western world where we drink tons of milk and tons of dairy. And the calcium that's in dairy is eight times stronger, I think four or eight times stronger than our mother's milk. So it just makes us grow big and tall. Yeah, I'm from Sweden, we all grew tall. But we have so much more fractures from osteoporosis, osteopenia, osteoporosis, that is in the world we live in, the Western world, that we have these problems. So no, it's, I, I don't know who says vegans have more of that. Absolutely not. But uh, if I'm vegan and I don't exercise, I don't lift weights, I have to put, I have to put, lift weights because the Putting uh, weight on my muscles actually builds my bones. So that's, there's only one way to build bone. It's, it's left weightlifting, <laughs> you know. What do you do if you've been exposed to a lot of medical radiation in your life? How can you get it out of your body? So medical radiation. Oh, and I just want to add a few things to the osteoporosis too, because that calcium that's so high in cow's milk drains your bones and teeth of calcium. So that's really important to know. It does the opposite. All the ads about, you know, got dairy and, and the calcium uh, that you need so well, it drains it. It drains it. So now, so what can we do about radiation we get from x-rays and dental x-rays, right? So we take saunas every day. It's one of the best, it's called far infrared sauna. Heats you from the inside out, sit there 15, 20, half an hour uh, and really pour sweat. That's great. Otherwise we can take a bath with sea salt and baking soda. So. Baking soda is a great help. I take a cup of sea salt, a pound of, ba of baking soda. I can put some aromatherapy oils in there. And I sit in that twice a week um, to clean up. But sauna is even better. And then, of course, I want to eat the pure, rich diet, too, to help that. And uh, we can take implants. of Here we do wheatgrass implants. So we actually take uh, in a little syringe, we take wheatgrass juice and we take it rectally and it helps to clean because everything, liver is the detox organ in your body. Everything goes there sooner or later. So this implant actually helps not only to clean your large intestine and intestine up all the way to the liver. It's amazing. What do you recommend for someone who has gastrointestinal pain that already eats a whole food plant-based diet. So if I'm on a whole food, yes. If I'm on a whole food uh, plant-based diet and I still have a lot of gas, if I have acid reflux or, you know, I just don't digest well, I'm not eliminating well, you probably have too much sugar in some way. You probably have too much fruit. I would say there must be something because even people that had serious problem, Crohn's colitis that comes here, after a few weeks on this diet, they're like, oh my God, the bleeding stopped, their, 
their um, elimination, it's not diarrhea anymore, it's coming out soft and different, so in the right way. And so if I have that, maybe I need more enzymes. We take digestive enzymes, we take probiotic to help it. Uh, I actually make a water with flax seeds. I call it flax water. And I take, let's say I have a 16 ounce cup. I take two tablespoons in that, stir it, let it sit overnight and I can drink it first thing in the morning. That should help. Maybe I'm not eating enough uh, fiber. Maybe it's not enough fiber in my diet. Maybe I cook everything because a lot of plant-based eaters are you know, organic, but they cook everything. That's a different deal. Doesn't come in with enzyme, no oxygen. So now the body is depleted of all of that. So it, it's individual. We would definitely work with a person like that. <laughs> yes. What do you recommend for someone with eczema? Oh, eczema, like, um, like skin rashes and psoriasis amazing results with this lifestyle. Of course, they can take, here we have beautiful pools. We have a mineral pool with all kinds of minerals that they can be in. Then they can make their own bath with sea salt and baking soda, which is good for them. We have our own skincare line called Become. You can eat it, it's so pure. We also have our own cosmetic line uh, with everything that any woman would need. But this is um, a help. We can use different parts of that and put it all over our body and um, help with that. We also use uh, things like cell food gel. Cell food gel, you can probably find in your health store and silver gel, but it comes from the inside. It comes from the inside. And sometimes it's due to parasites. With our testing, I get you know, I get a pretty big picture of if, if there's this, if it's fungus, if it's parasites, if it's infections, you know, there's different reasons why I have this too. What do you think about birth control pills? So, yeah, okay. I've been, I got in trouble a few times take, telling people to get off. <laughs> so we became godparents for one of the babies. <laughs> But the deal is, it's not healthy for a woman. Birth control pills, strokes, cancer, it's not healthy. And a woman needs to know that once you're on it and you decide to get off it, there's no way back. You can't get off and on, off and on. The cancer risk is going gradually higher. So <laughs> what is good for a woman? Well, there is things like diaphragm, there is things, but they're all bacteria, uh, stacks kind of because bacteria loves to stack around anything that doesn't have frequency in your body and so all the bad guys hang out there I say condoms is the only thing or we use the monthly time of when you really can get pregnant or you can get pregnant all any time of the month but so now it goes back to relationships and learning about um, intimacy. I think this is huge. That should be taught in every church and synagogue and temple, you know. Again, these are basics of life, basics of life. And now so many couples can't get pregnant. So many couples come here and they go through the program and Many have been successful to actually have babies after this process. Some have been made here. <laughs> so, you know, it's not that easy anymore. It's not that easy. Uh, and a lot of people wait a long time before they try to get pregnant too. And, you know, now, of course, every woman that's in their 40s are scared and they've been told that the risk of having a child with, um, with problems is much, much higher. I had my last at 42. And then I learned something nice about that. I learned that you have much greater chance to live to 100 if you've had a child after 40. <laughs> Not that I know I'm going to live that long, but hey, 
if I can live a healthy, long life, that's, that's all I ask for. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Botox fillers and facelift surgery? What is safe and what's not? Well, I just talked to a lady who had Botox. She's had problem ever since. She had an allergic reaction. She nearly died. And she now has inflammation all over through her body. So I would think twice. There are other more natural things that you can do. Like you can take your own fat and you can fill up if you need it. There are a lot of plastic surgeons that knows how to do that. So I'd rather take my own fat and fill than Botox. What's happened over the last 40 years when you have told the health, medical, and nutritional world about the results you've seen from people following a whole raw food diet and lifestyle? Yeah, and there, a lot of, lot of people in the medical world actually don't want to hear it. They, um, they are not interested, but there is a whole group of alternative uh, physicians. You know, there's lots of them that are so interested. Of course, the first Lifestyle Institute is in, and Vigmore, uh, our founder, um, her, uh, her country that she was born in, and she left when she was a teenager with Lithuania. And we have a memorial. There is an amazing university that anybody can come and do a lifestyle, uh, get a master in lifestyle medicine. So, you know, so that's growing. And that example hopefully will jump over to every university. They, every university should want to have this lifestyle course in their, in their curriculum. But, you know, I, I would say that we get more um, response from people that are not into medicine because you know what they've been taught in medicine unfortunately is that you know diet is not that important and that dietitians are even learning that you need meat poultry you need eggs you need dairy and vegetables yes and fruits but that the dairy and the poultry and the meat and all that is much, it's very important to keep going. Look in the hospital, look at the food in the hospital. That's what you get. And you even get desserts <laughs> and, you, and it's all cooked on top of it, it's all cooked. So talking about enzymes and oxygen and you know, talking about how amazing people recover, it's gonna take, I think, a few generations to really understand that this lifestyle that we've had is not sustainable and yes population is growing it will be by 2050 i think we've been nine billion people so how do we feed them how do they feed are they going to feed on animals then there'll be no land left there'll be no land left and we there'll be no forest left either it would be total deforestation because we need that land for cattle and pigs and big farms. And so, it, you know, we're, we're in a time when I think we, we should know that we, we can make it or break it. If you listen to science, the ocean, uh, ocean science, there'd be no more fish in the ocean by 2048. Is. If there's no fish in the ocean, we're not here. So we are in a make and a break time. And, you know, I wish everybody would see this conference in April, The Real Truth About Health. Boy, is this important. And everybody who's speaking comes from their heart and tells their experience and the information that you're not going to hear anywhere else. So this is really important. And I, and I thank everybody. I thank you, I thank Stephen Shore. I thank everybody that's that's helping to make this such a success. And you know, this time we're not in Long Island. We're not there to you know socialize and schmooze and really be together and hug each other. But we're here. We're there. We're here. What health advice would you give to all women who are twenty-one to forty? Oh, 21 to 40, that's the best time. 
although I say my time is now also the best time, <laughs> but you know, this is the fruitful years, the very fruitful years in our life. We're like this flower that's just flowering and, and should have so much fun and stay healthy and be vibrant. Well, I would say, first of all, learn what plant-based mean. Learn how to get nourishment. You know, come to places like ours, come to the real truth about health and realize that the nourishment in plants as they grow, of course, we need good soil. Without good soil, the plant won't have what we think it should have, but we wanna go organic. We want to go cruel-free food, which there is no cruel-free animal-based food. There is none. And if you look at farm, uh, farm, industrial farms, nobody looks after those animals. Nobody. PETA doesn't, um, or PETA maybe. Uh, FDA doesn't. EPA doesn't look after the workers. And APSA, ASPCA doesn't. Nobody, nobody. These animals are totally for whoever wants to do whatever they want to do. And the meat is so sick because they're treated with antibiotic until they're killed. So, you know, that just skip that whole thing. Go plant based, go organic, GMO free. And exercise, put exercise in to daily. Um, we like Brian and I do weight training Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And all the other days we walk morning and evening. Then we swim. Of course, we, you know, we have the oceans. We have beautiful pools here. There's no chlorine in our pools. There's ozone and minerals. And sleep, go to sleep, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't stay up and, and waste your time on TV and cell phones. Go to sleep early. The earlier, the better. Sleep good. Now, you're, now you have energy. You're going to have babies in, within this time. You're going to have work to do. You either are, are home with your kids, which is huge work, or you work in an office, or you work as a doctor or a nurse, or you know whatever you choose to do you're gonna be successful. You're gonna have a different life, but you have to prioritize your health. Prioritize your health is absolutely the most important. And the people who lost it will tell you that. Anybody who lost it will tell you, boy, I wish I prioritized it. What is gluten? Who should avoid it? If you keep eating it, will you end up with celiac disease? Should we avoid wheats and oats and barley since they have gluten? Are all other whole grains like quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, and wild rice safe for a celiac patient? So a lot of uh, our guests that comes here have celiac. This is the perfect diet. Um, we don't have soy. We don't have uh, gluten. We don't have dairy. I tell them there's nothing here that would hurt you. So between the sprouts and the, um, the, all the vegetables and the dishes that we do, usually nobody has a problem. Some people might have some garlic and onion, um, you know, allergy. And so we tell the kitchen and they have the notes up in the kitchen and it says, okay, this person can't have that. And so we make dishes without it. And, um, you know, it's um, usually not a problem, but gluten is very destructive for our digestive tract. What a, a German study about 40 years ago came out and said, if a baby, if an infant is fed gluten before they're four months old, their chance of getting the diabetes type one is quadruple, quadruple. Imagine that. And so a lot of people are on dairy and gluten and finding that they are um, diagnosed with diabetes type one much later in life at 30 years old. How's that happening? So the intolerance of gluten and dairy is huge for all of us, but some, some got used to it through generations, especially being Scandinavian. Are we supposed to have it? No. And so gluten is 
in foods that that like rye, oats, and barley, and wheat, of course, and kamut and spelt, but I can sprout it. I can soak it overnight in a bowl. I can sprout it. I sprout it in a colander. It's like the spaghetti strainer. It's kind of easy, and I rinse it twice a day. They start growing a little sprout. Now the gluten is gone. <clears throat> so that I can make crackers and things out of that. But then there are the gluten-free grains already, millet, quinoa, amaranth, teff, you know, buckwheat. These are great for anybody with celiac. Make crackers, make good stuff out of that. Cereals. Mm -hmm. What makes you think sleep is so important? What time do you go to sleep each night and when do you wake up? So I go to sleep, uh, well, sometimes now I go at eight, but usually by nine and wake up early. So nine to five usually. And um, so I'm an early riser. Brian and I are early risers. I, we like to do things in the morning, at nighttime. I want to go to bed. <laughs> so it depends on if you're a night person or morning person. I'm definitely a morning person. So sleep is when you heal. You heal. You heal bones. You heal tissue, scars, you know, wounds. You're healing. And you're making neurotransmitters. You're making your dopamine. You're making... Uh, GABA, you make serotonin, melatonin, you know, all of this that you need for the whole day to be able to function and feel good and express yourself the right way and not be angry and frustrated and, you know, sad and all these things. So that it's huge. Sleep is huge. And you know, when you don't sleep, you can't think straight. Your memory is out the door and it's dangerous. It's dangerous. You don't have the concentration when you're driving, you know. Did you hear the latest about pilots that's been now uh, laid off during COVID? And then they came back and they forgot, they forgot things. They forgot things already because they probably didn't sleep enough. The, what the kids are doing right now is that they're studying at night and sleeping during the day. So they're their um, total lifestyle changed. So that means they're eating at night too. They're getting fatter, getting fatter. With that comes cardiovascular problem, diabetes, you name it. What should you do if you had COVID nine months ago, but the symptoms still haven't gone away? Oh, we have great. So a lot of people come here who has just had COVID or who had it in November or January or last year, and then they don't have themselves back. We do hyperbaric, hyperbaric is great. We do, uh, of course, all the diet in themselves, but especially after hyperbaric, people feel like I'm getting myself back. You're getting, here we give a core kit, a core of all the supplements. We, of course, in there we have B12, we have vitamin D, we have enzyme, systemic enzyme. We have um, probiotic. We have chlorella, which is the green algae. And that is a good help for them too. So we, we have the core kit of that because that's what we feel is the core when it comes to supplements. And of course, you can add the iodine, zinc, and selenium as an immunobooster too. That is, that is a great small amount. And um, I tell you, exercise, just getting out in the fresh air and exercise and swim and being around people. And here we don't wear masks here. When people come in, we test everyone. We test everybody every week. Our staff is tested. So we we're, we're, have not have one case, not one case. Why was it important for you to come back and speak here at The Real Truth About Health Com? Well, this is a gift and you're among amazing people that speak here. So, I mean, how can you not feel uh, as you are rewarded that you can speak here and that you, that you have something to share? I mean, I feel there's so much I wanna share that if we can put it into a short time and inspire other people, other women, for sure, um, to change lifestyle and be more committed, who might say, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. It's time. That would make it all worth, all worth. 
Well, we certainly do appreciate all of your time, all of your meaningful work, and for sharing everything with us, um, as you always do. Thank you, Anna Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon. Be well. We'll see you soon. Take care. <laughs> see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.